Welcome to the Emeka Wani Show, brought to you by Ara House Studios. Here, I'll bring interesting discussions with leading individuals in various fields, discussing their successes, setbacks, and everything in between. I also hope I can bring one or two laughs along the way. Welcome to the Emeka Wani Show. Today, we're doing things a little bit differently. As you know, I usually sit down with special guests to get to know them a bit better. But on today's episode, I asked the audience to ask me a few questions so you can get to know me. I really hope you like it. And please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Let's go. So again, thank you so much for the questions. Let's go. So first question, why did you start the show? Um, this is an interesting one. For me, this is something I've been planning to do for a while, up since like 2021. Well, you know how things are. I procrastinated. I was anxious about, you know, starting about the future and like, you know, how it, how it would look. But at the start of 2024, end of 2023, actually, I spoke to Larry Vigo and I was like, you know what, bro, like, can you do this with me? And I think it's just a testament. Like sometimes you just have to start. And as I've started now, I feel like things are making a lot more sense. Things are falling into place. And it's just for anybody that's listening. Sometimes we're so anxious to start something because we want it to be perfect. And I'm a perfectionist, to be honest. And I'm just so happy I actually started. And since I started, like I said, things have been falling into place. Opportunities have been coming. So I think for me, that's just uh, that's just the thing I live with here is just start what you just start with what's in your heart. Okay, next question: When did you start supporting Man United and why? Um, this is a great question for me. Man United has been my team since about 1998, and ironically, the first the next question is about my age. And me saying I supported United since 1998, I think it's giving that away. So I was eight years old when I started supporting Man United. And this was the time when, around the time when we won the treble, when we won the Champions League, the Premier League and the FA Cup. And the likes of David Beckham, Andy Cole, you know, Sir Alex Ferguson, Paul Scholes, that was just my team. And anybody in my era would know, at that time, you're either a United fan or an Arsenal fan. And even though my dad was an Arsenal fan, I don't know, for whatever reason, United was my team and they've been my team ever since. Now it's just heartbreak, Sha, but, you know, for me, the, the day I started supporting Man United in 1998, is something that's been with me ever since, and it's such an honor to keep on supporting them, even now we're trash. Next one, what does faith mean to you? I think that's a great, that's a great question again. I think faith is something that has been a steadfast part of my life, but I think like with all of us, faith can be up and down in the sense where when it, when a time now of logic, of science, of information. So I'm not going to lie and say, you know, my faith has been unshaken my whole life. I think I've gone through periods when, you know, you're, you're deep diving, you're searching and, you know, you're looking for the answer for the truth. But what I would say that despite those moments, I believe in my heart, it's always been a thing of knowing God is there, knowing God is there for me and protecting me, protecting my family. And he's there, he's true, he's real. Um, but I'm not going to lie and say it's never been shaken because it has. And even till now, I keep on searching. You're searching in the Bible. You're searching and trying to just find who this God is for yourself. Because, you know, we all grew up with parents teaching you the Bible, teaching you about God. But I think it's very important to find God for yourself. And I think that's the journey I've been on. And I feel now this stage of my life is the, is the part of the journey where I'm fully confident in, in that. I'm confident in myself. I'm confident in Him and thankful for, for Him. So that's a great question. Thank you for that. And the next question, will you send me dollars? Guy, I have, a, I have a feeling I know who this question is from. I mean, I define dollars, so yeah, you know, that's not going to happen. And, and just, that's just funny because my wife always teases me about my, my pigeon, so I don't know. I don't know how that came out, but yeah, no dollars for you, bro. Um, so next one, would you say you're a petty person? I'm an extremely petty person. I'm not going to lie. Extremely, extremely petty. I'm the kind of person that Let's say like police, the, you know, when police like on, on the random checkpoints, they stop you just trying to get something. I can, they, I can, they can ask for all the papers. I'll give them all the papers except one, knowing that they are looking for money. And at the end, when they're not trying to ask for the money, I'll now show them the last paper just so they can be disappointed. And that kind of person. When you're trying to be petty, I'll, I, my petty is times 10. So I can, I can, play, I can play that game as well. Um, I'll say I'm not so proud of it, but I think it's part of who I am. I'm a very competitive person. Um, I can be quite petty, like I said. But I think it's, I don't think it's such a bad thing. Like, I think if it's done in decent faith and if or all, you're not, you're not, a, you're not a terrible person. I think it's not so bad. I think a lot of us Nigerians, I think we're mainly quite petty. Let's be honest. Nigeria has shown us a lot of, a lot of stress. So I think, I don't think I'm, I'm alone here. Next question. What sport do you wish you could play apart from football? 
this was another great question. For me, I think it's tennis. I've played other like team sports, basketball, you know, obviously football. But I think the idea of playing tennis like a solo sport, when you get to be in your own mind, face adversity by yourself, you know, be your own person, have to dig deep to be able to succeed. Uh, I think that's a sport I'd love to play. Also, fun fact, I'm left-handed. So Nadal has always been like an icon for me. So being able to play with my left hand and, you know, attempt those shots and, you know, try and succeed in the game, I think that would have been an amazing sport. And I think it's a sport that's obviously growing as well. So I think in Nigeria, it, there's, there's a lot of room for growth here. So I think definitely tennis would be the answer. Uh, I can't think of any other sport that would be passionate enough to want to su su succeed at. Okay, next question. Where have you always wanted to travel to? Uh, hmm. I think Greece, I think Greece is one. Greece is one because I'm a history, I'm a very, very big history nerd. You might not, you might not realize this, but I'm the kind of person that deep dives in all these things, like in history, um, like different artifacts, you know, ancient Egypt, like I said, Greece as well. Looking at the Mayans in South America, I'm a very, very big history buff. So I think Greece for me, being able to like visit like the Acropolis and just like Athens and just kind of seeing all the, the you know, historical um, figures and, you know, statues and locations. I think that's something that would be an amazing thing to do. I think Brazil as well would be another great one. And just based on the color, the vibrancy of the city. Of course, it's the home of football as well. You know, England would dispute that, but like Brazil is the home of football. And just being able to experience that over there, like the beaches, you know, possibly even the carnival. I think Brazil will be, will be a really good one to, to experience. Next question. What's an unpopular opinion you have about anything? Hmm, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, don't let me get cancelled. Um, okay, no, I think, this, I think this is important to say. I would say it's about sexual discipline. I think especially as men, I think it's very, very important. If you're trying to succeed or achieve big things, I think you have to have discipline in life in general, but also in that aspect. Because let's be real, we know how these things can be. It can throw you off your path. It can, you know, like make you lack focus because you're just chasing the next thing, chasing the next thing. And the reality, honestly, is that, is it ever enough? And I think it's important if you do want to be in a committed relationship going forward, whatever you're doing before that, I think just because you signed a piece of paper to get married or to do whatever, you're not going to change those habits afterwards. So I just think like, what's the actual ultimate goal? And think about it, will you ever actually be satisfied? So I think discipline in that aspect is very, very important. It's very, very, very important. Because again, if you're looking to be in something serious after, I think you have to build those boundaries before you get into that so you can succeed in the life after that. Because you trust me, no matter how much you think you'll be satisfied, you never will be. So I think as men, and for women as well, I think discipline in life is very, very important. But I think sexual discipline, especially now in this day and age, I know it's not the cool thing to say. As a young man or whatever, like it's not the cool thing to say. But I think as men, it's something we need to strive towards. It's not easy, no judgment. It's not easy at all. But I think it's something we need to strive towards. You know. So next question. Do you have a script for your podcast or does the conversation just flow? Uh, I, I think I have a, I have a script in the sense where I have a structure. So like I have a structure of where I want the conversation to go, how I want the conversation to go. But you have to let these things flow for the conversation to be authentic, for the guests to feel comfortable. You can't just be on a rigid script, right? But like there has to be a structure so you don't go all over the place. So you can kind of also guide your, your interviewee. Um, so you can get to the right places and touch the right points. But there's no there's no script. There's just a structure and a guide. So, you know, we can have a good frame of a conversation. <laughs> okay, I like this question. What's the misconception people usually have about you? I think this this is an easy one. I'll say people just think, I just talk about sports. I just love sports. That's all I care about. And yes, sports is my first love. Sorry, Chioma. Sports, sports is my first love. Um, that's that's been my passion since I was in primary school and it still is but part of why I'm doing this show and have this channel and the American Wani show is I want to touch on a lot of other things I love sports which I will, I will continue to have that on my show but I also want to talk about life I want to talk about relationships I want to talk about how people struggle to overcome certain things overcoming boundaries overcoming, overcoming struggles temptations just life in general I think as young people there's so much out there and there's so much I think that we're getting wrong and not just by like personal choice but just like situations times are hard 
And we are human, right? So we can never get things completely right. But like, I think there's so many conversations and things we can touch on. And I hope with the different guests I have and my own conversations with you as well, that we can touch on those things and continue to get better as, you know, young Nigerians and young people in general. Next question. What situation have you faced that made you realize there was a God looking out for you? Uh, another good one. Um, this is actually, people will know this. At maybe in like 2015, I almost got electrocuted. And it was a very, very big deal. But And I might sound a bit flippant about it because, you know, when you're in these things, sometimes you don't realize. So my mom like ran down the stairs, you know, saw me on the floor. So obviously I don't have a major myself on the floor, right? So when she was so emotional and constantly, constantly till today, she keeps on bringing that up. I still don't resonate with it as much as she does because I didn't see myself on the floor. But I came to luckily and, you know, thank God everything was fine. So I think for me, that was one moment that really showed me that, you know, someone is out there looking for me. And, you know, my faith, like I said, of course, it's still up and down. We're human, but my faith has been steadfast ever since then. Okay, next question. What's the most overrated thing slash experience during high school that everyone was on? Uh, high school, I went to um, British International School. And I think there, there was very, very little physical, you know, abuse. Everyone was pretty soft, to be honest. But because of that, there was there was so much verbal abuse and verbal bullying. And I think it was a thing where, that everyone was on. I was a victim to it. I was part of it as well. And I think that's one thing that is very overrated because those things cut. And I know people from that school and that class, even now, that are still kind of, you can see them still struggling with those things. You can see them trying to overcompensate for those things. And I think that was something that a lot of us young people did and you know how verbal bullying can be very, very serious, especially when you're younger. I was teased a lot for being very dark when I used to play football in the sun all the time. I'm not as dark anymore, but I will never forget it because it's, it really resonated with me back then. So I'll say that's one thing like back then that everyone was in on that was definitely overrated. And it's not cool for younger people even watching that. Your words matter and they have an effect on people. Even now, I'm in my 30s, people, I'm sure people older than that still remember certain things that they were called when they were younger. What's, what are your favorite things to do when not working? Uh, my dream, my dream free time, again, is watching football. Like a Saturday morning, Saturday, maybe like 12, 12 p.m. kickoff, watching Man United, watching football in general. For me, that's just like peace and bliss. Uh, it's my favorite thing to do. Also, like watching Netflix and just like staying home with my wife. I think that's also another special thing I love to do. It just keeps me very relaxed. It's very peaceful. I'm not worrying about anything. I think going to watch the movies as well. Going to the movies as well is a big thing for me. Watching the latest movies, having like popcorn, I get like a large popcorn and balance, I balance very well. And I think for me, that's that's also a really, really fun thing to do. I'm not, I'm not a very difficult person at all. I think for me, free time is meant to be free time to relax and to rest. I'm not one to love to go out too much. I go out, but not too much. It's not, it's very, very draining emotionally and like mentally draining after a long week. So I think those things for me are the most important things to do to, to unwind. Okay, do you have any regrets or things you wish you had done better when you were younger? Um, this might sound a, a, a bit cliche, and my wife teases me about this a, a lot as well. I'm not one for regrets. I'm very much one of those people that things happen for a reason. I know it's cliche, I know, but I really, I really look like outside, the, like on the big picture. I don't obsess over small things because I always just kind of understand that these things all lead to something. Of course, there are moments you cringe at, right? So when I'm long, younger, maybe a time you tripped or a decision you made. But like, I always feel like I'm able to like backtrack and trace how these things, you know, led to where I was. So maybe like a past relationship or maybe something else. And you're like, damn, like, did I really need to do this? But I feel like all those things always lead you on to like where you're meant to be. So there's no point. I'm also very a very logical person, right? So no point obsessing over things that have gone in the past and you might as well just see how it's affected you and improved you so you can also move forward but when you're constantly obsessing over mistakes you did this you did that for me it's wasted energy and i think it's um it's just something that as young people we should not obsess on or obsess over because it's done and just see how it improved you and try and learn from those mistakes because if you're obsessing over it it's just going to stop your growth what's the most important decision you've ever made hmm. I shouldn't actually be thinking hard about this, but I think it's fairly obvious. I've mentioned her a few times. It's getting married. I think, again, as a young man, it's 
it's one of the toughest decisions you're going to make. I know I, my friends, I preach like, you know, how important, like great marriage is and how much I love it. But I, I also tell them as well, you have to understand it's a massive decision. And that's why a lot of men are scared, understandably so. A lot of women are scared, understandably so. Things, you know, like they say, streets are hard. I get it, right? But you do have to get it right. And it's adding more pressure to what's already a pressurized situation and decision. But that's the most important decision I had to make. You have to weigh in so many things. You know, how, you know, the friendship, like you, you best friends, will she be a great mother or will, will he be a great father? You know, the, the in-laws, you know, the siblings, everything. It's, there's so much that goes into it. You're thinking 50 years down the line. And again, if you're someone that overthinks, which I can be, it's tough, right? But I think what you have to do, you have to, you, you take the plunge when, when the time comes, but you have to take the plunge when you're as sure as you can be. But I think for me, that's definitely the most important decision I had to make. You don't choose your family. I have an amazing family, but I never chose them, you know? So, and your friends, you kind of grow along with them as well. But like, this is one decision you make, that you're making a decision for the rest of your life, right? So I think for me, that's definitely it. And um, we thank God, it's been an amazing, amazing marriage so far. Next one. A lot of, oh, so actually, yeah, it, it kind of ties into it. A lot of young men are scared of marriage. Why did you get married when you did? And what advice would you give men that are scared of the next step? So kind of repeating myself here, understandably, I know why there's that fear or apprehension, trepidation, because it's a decision for life. You don't choose your job for life. You don't choose your family for life. It's, this is something you're choosing for life. So I completely understand the situation. And being in Lagos, I know how messy things are, right? So, but it, it is a big decision. You have to understand that there's no sugar coating. It is a big decision. But I'll say, if you get it right, I don't think there's anything better in this world. It's an amazing thing. And the, the, the upside is so high. It's so high that if you take the risk, when you're as sure as you can be, because you can never be 100% sure, but when you're as sure as you can be, you're ready and you found a great person, I think it's an amazing thing. Okay, next question. Aside family, a wife, who would you say is your closest friend? <laughs> this is a trap question. I, I know, I'm sure I know who's asking this. Uh, nah, I can't pick one person. I'm I'm blessed to have a group of friends that I have been friends with. Some since nursery school, some since primary school, uh, some since first year secondary school. We're in a group chat together. We talk every day, and I feel so blessed to have these guys like Ebitari and Ekan, Michael, Awal, Yemi, Sami, Chibi. Like, wow, well, I have such a close community of friends that and cousin Chibi that it's 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 just a blessing so i can't pick one out i'm just so blessed to have these guys they carry me when i'm down you know we have fun together we we get deep together so it's a blessing to have these guys and i know he's asking this question they're trying to trap me but it's not gonna happen um okay this is a football question now do you think stats are ruining the game and making it so mechanical and also removing flair Mm, that's a very good that's a great question yes definitely an element of that Ronaldo and Messi they completely spoiled the game they're scoring 40, 50, 60 goals a season and I think now we judge players just on stats and things like that and I think there's an element of those guys being so good that now you see even like a, you know a Haaland is now like judged on the numbers and if you're not getting those kinds of numbers Mbappe you're looking at just the numbers you're not really looking at the ability of players as much as we used to and I think that there's definitely an element of that Midfielders now, they're trying to get assists. Bruno Fernandes, sometimes an easy pass is there. He's trying to get the assist. He's going for the killer pass all the time. So I think stats have become a big part of the game because of Ronaldo and Messi for sure. But I think there's also an element of the way managers play in today's game. You're looking at the Peps, the Nagelsmanns, the Klops. There's a lot of pressing. There's a lot of physicality required. Even like Arteta, a lot of physicality pressing required that I feel players are becoming a bit mechanical. I think Michael Owen said it. Like now, really like what is really being judged on the most is can you run can you run for hours and you see all these players like say even midfielders today the bellinghams the Declan rices the barellas the tonalis it's now back to the all-round midfielder game and i think now those artists are, are dying out you see like the likes of ozils even like tiago alcantara like these artists of like this generation they're being ex for midfielders or for players that can do a lot of running, a lot of pressing. And like the likes of, like I said, these managers are requiring players to play that way. And if you can't perform in that way, you're being exed out. 
and you see how we judge players of the past that maybe didn't have the numbers like maybe like of the or, uh, players like a Giggs or a Perez or even like a Zidane and like Iniesta like people are, were looking back at those players and you hear them call so like Perez or Giggs like a fraud because maybe they were scoring like 10 or 11 goals a season but at that time the football was just a completely different sport in the way they, uh, they were judged and the way they played and I think now it's different. I don't know if it's better, but it's definitely different. And I think how I judge, I think the eye test is very important, right? Stats have to be there because everybody's eye test is different. So, but a bit of a balance. But I feel the way we watch the game now and analyze the game now is definitely a bit toxic, a bit mechanical. And I can't say I'm in love with the way the football, the, with the game, the way the game is going. And I hope football fans as well can start using our eyes a bit more and not just arguing about numbers all the time because it, it is a bit tiring and it's a bit, a bit, it's a bit simple. And I don't think that's the best for, for the game. Okay. Another football question. What advice would you give someone who wants to play football professionally? <laughs> well, I didn't make it. I tried, I didn't make it. But I think the only thing I can say is you have to start them early, right? This is in Nigeria sometimes we, we play, we play like on supervised football, just regular football, then you try to make it as a teenager. That's not gonna happen. These kids in academies are playing from like five, six, seven years old. Right, so that's not going to happen if you're if you're starting as a teenager. So the best thing I can say is start them early. The academies in Nigeria, the Spring Major Entertainment Academy, there's King's Courts Academy, there's even like now Inter Lagos has a team. Now we have all these clubs in Lagos as well. You can get on that pathway, but you have to start them young. You have to start them young, or else by the time they're good and they're they're older, they're a bit too late because the kids ahead of them have had the fundamentals from an early age. So I think starting them young is the only is the only way. Okay, another mar- another marriage question. Tips on having a good marriage. Um, so I'm not gonna act like I'm the biggest expert. I've just been married for like a year and a bit. But what I can say is communication. I think with any relationship, your friends, your family, your spouse, communication is the main thing. You guys have to communicate well because in marriage there are a lot of uncommunicated expectations. And if you don't talk and you don't communicate, you're going to be let down a lot of times because you think someone is not looking out for you when they just don't know, right? Well, I forgot what they're saying is sometimes it's just ignorance and not malice because sometimes we're human beings. We have so many things on our minds. We're working, you know, we have, you know, tired days, sick days, whatever it is, right? So sometimes it's just ignorance or forgetfulness and not malice. So I think communication is a massive, massive key. But I also think doing things together is, is, incre- is incredibly important. You're meant to bury your best friend. So do things together. Don't just do things with your boys. Do things together. Go out together. Pray together. Do fun things together. Travel together. You know, it's very, very important. But there needs to be a balance. Don't become that person that is only with your spouse. Having a healthy amount of time with your friends, you know, your your bros, your sis, your sisters, everything is very, very important as well. If you just live your life, my spouse and my spouse alone, I can guarantee you it's not going to lead to a happy life. Some of the greatest times I have is just be with my friends on a Saturday, just talking, just in, watching sports, you know, having a few drinks. Those are some of the happiest moments I have. So I think it's very important to have that balance between spending time with your spouse, which should be your priority, but also having a healthy amount of time with your friends because those are some of the happiest times you will have as well. Finances in marriage. Ah, again, I'm not an expert on this one. I'm not an expert on this one. All I'll say again with anything, just have your partner in mind in all you're doing. Right, some of the expenses and things you spend your money on as a single person, you have to know that now there's someone else in the picture. So you sense. I mean, I don't. I don't think I need to tell you this. You sense, and have your partner in mind. Don't go overspending, especially if you're a man. You have to take care of your partner. Don't just spend your money on silly things. Just keep your partner in mind. I think that's just pretty simple and sensible advice. How do I envisage <laughs> retirement? Well, I'm far, I'm far away from that. But I mean, all I can say is I just hope I'm older and I'm not having to hustle in my 50s and 60s. Like the hustle is meant for now, right? So this is the time to earn. And that, that's what I'm, my focus is on now. So when I'm older, I can do what I want to do and not because I have to do it, right? So that's kind of how I look at life. And by God's grace, by that stage, I'm doing things I enjoy doing. I'm not doing things too um, because I'm hustling. What's your fitness? <laughs> what's your fitness routine? Uh, for me, fitness is a big part of my life, but I'll say my motivation is a bit selfish. To be honest, the only reason I really work out or do anything is I just don't want my belly to come out of my shirt. That's just really it. I'm not going to lie to you guys. That's my motivation. I don't want my belly to stick out of my shirt. 
So I work out maybe like twice a week. I play football once a week. Nothing crazy. I'm not trying to be big. I'm not trying to be world's strongest man. My motivation is so my belly doesn't stick out of my shirt. Really, that's it. So two days a week, go to the gym, regular stuff. And then I play football once a week and I'm good. And of course, I, you try to eat well as well. I think that's very important. I try to eat well. Okay, we're coming to the end of this. And it's been an amazing time. It's been an amazing time. I hope you've enjoyed it as well. So one of the last questions is, as the first child, how have your relationships with your parents and siblings evolved over the years? That's a great question. That's deep. So you might not know, I've been, I was the only child for about eight years. So it was just myself and my parents for, for that long. Then my brother came eight years after, my sister came 12 years after. So with my parents, I think I have achieved the dream. I think the dream for every parent slash child dynamic is get to the point where your parents are your friends. And now I've got to that point now, my parents are my friends. I just them about everything, everything and anything, you know? We talk, it's not, it's not like a parent and um, son relationship anymore. We're just friends. And I, I'm blessed that they've raised me well enough. Of course, I know my boundaries, but now I'm just so happy I can share like my adult life, like my marriage, like my successes with them as well. And we're just able to gist and they're, you know, sharing their wisdom and advice to me as well. So I'm so blessed that now like you know i just i just sit down with them and just chop it up right and it's a blessing and with my siblings i'll say it's similar again with the age gap i was always like almost like a pseudo guardian or like you know a big bro but now they're now university they're now living their lives and now we've got to that point where they don't just give me their experiences i'm able to like you know drop a, f a few bits of knowledge here and there but the kind of person i am like i'll just drop that i'm not trying to force you to do anything or direct you i'm just trying to you know, like advise you, but like in a subtle way, because everybody has to make their mistakes, right? So now with my siblings, we're, we're friends, we're besties. They're teaching me all these new things, all, all the new lingo and everything. So I'm just really blessed where I am in life. And um, I'm so thankful for them. So we've come to the end of the episode. Um, I really thank you guys for watching and for sending in questions on Instagram. It's been quite therapeutic for me. And I really appreciate having to look back at different experiences and life in general. I hope we can do this maybe once every season, you know, as the community continues to grow, you know, we can we can do this, you know, every so every so often. So again, thank you for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Please don't forget to like, share and subscribe so we can continue to grow. Thank you so much. Have a good day. Talk soon.